Thank you very much. Um, so, um, like I said, my name's Gareth, um, and I'd like to share with you our meme-tastic story, uh, of our experiences operating Docker containers, and an alternative paradigm to orchestrating, monitoring, and scaling. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to take you all back in time to the early noughties when a young, unmustachioed man walks into the technology center of a uh, large telco. He sits down at his desk and his supervisor, Spencer, hands him a hard disk in a drive bay because hot desking was really important at this company uh, and tells him to install Gentoo Linux from stage one install because building an operating system from scratch will be a good learning exercise. And then when they're done, the pair of them can go over the script which Spencer had been working on, which was to, to automate the testing of uh, new subscribers on a Cisco 10,000 series router. <clears throat> and we never made it to that script because that was the first time in my life that I had ever compiled an operating system. But it was also the first time in my life where I was suddenly immersed in a world of highly skilled engineers and architects who were doing some incredible things because they had to. They were doing all the DevOps things way before DevOps was even a thing. Uh, you could say that the whole team was ahead of the curve with many things. We were running containers in production 10 years ago. Um, and personally, I bought, built a, a small self-service virtual machine infrastructure. Um, but it seems that word got out and some companies beat me to the punch. You might have heard of them. <clears throat> so just staying on history for a moment, has anybody got any idea when containers were introduced? When? Okay, before then. Say again? Five years ago? Clue, maybe? <laughs> 1979, we got the Chirut system call, which was kind of the birth of containers. In fact, there's been a number of iterations over the years, um, but with the introduction of cloud computing, um, people generally lost interest in them. Cloud just had a lot more enticing features. However, with the introduction of Docker, uh, and some new design patterns, um, interest is really high again. Unfortunately, whales, just like sharks, aren't exactly native to clouds. In our most common model of, cl of uh, cloud computing, there's a number of challenges, um, like maintaining the underlying virtual machines, when nowadays it's common for them to be disposable, and uh, port mapping, host ports to container ports, and then there's the ways of monitoring those containers, which we didn't personally think were particularly good or particularly secure, like having to run privileged containers to hook back into the Docker socket of the virtual machine, um, or actually access the vir uh, have access to the virtual machine in the first place. There's been a number of solutions that have come around to solve these problems, but they usually require you to build and maintain extra systems. If you look at Kubernetes as an example, that is a significant piece of infrastructure on its own that could, probably would, require you to have a whole team to set up and manage it. It brings in extra layers of complexity, required knowledge, um, support, and then you have to put some effort into uh, integrating your applications with it, which is probably going to create some kind of dependency. So it's no wonder, really, that there's a number of companies that are now offering Kubernetes as a service. For years, containers also enjoyed the benefits of bare metal performance, but being as most container deployments are running on cloud environments and layered in layers of virtualization, you don't usually get those performance gains either. What was once simple now has all these additional layers on top of it, so we just need to be careful that uh, we're not creating this big layer cake that's going to topple down on us at any point. As I mentioned earlier, I was lucky enough to find myself um, reasonably early in my career at this DevOps company um, where the, the KISS principle was embedded into the culture, and that was a telco. So if it can be done on a telco, personally, I believe that we can all run services and infrastructures where we get as much value as possible from all the supporting systems uh, that, we, that we do from the, uh, the services that we're... Uh, our customers are interacting with directly. <clears throat> so, why are so many companies investing in the future of containers? Well, standardization is a big one. Docker has introduced a really neat way to package uh, our applications and containers into lightweight images 
uh, that are easily shareable. Um, the images that can um, be ported from dev to prod, on-premise to public cloud, extremely easy. And even though most cloud providers don't run your containers on the metal, some of them do, uh, and there are also performance gains elsewhere, like startup times and the sizes of the images that are created. So if we utilize the underlying virtual machines correctly and keep our supporting infrastructure really simple, the total cost of ownership can be great. So let's continue our story, but a few years later, when we were working on a large uh, a cloud migration project for a music company, um, all of a sudden, everybody was united around the warnings that we were given about the high costs of public cloud. <clears throat> the company had a $150,000 a month AWS bill, and the significant part of the project was still yet to complete. That would have opened up a brand new data center every month. The problem with that was that there's no on-premise technology that we had that would come anywhere near close to the level of functionality and agility that we got from um, public clouds from AWS. So many projects began to find ways to reduce costs. Containerization was one of those projects, and Docker became a major technology choice. It had also been decided that um, because we'd already paid for our, um, the, all the machines in our data center, that we were going to have a hybrid cloud um, and get the, the most, uh, as much value as possible that we could from our physical assets. With their ease of portability, containers were going to make this much easier to achieve. Now, I was involved in the project, and let me be clear, we certainly suffered all of the common um, pitfalls that everybody comes across when, uh, when running containers. Admittedly, though, we didn't try puppies, um, but let's have a look at all our experience. <clears throat> our infrastructure consisted of bare metal, EC2, um, Zabbix, and, uh, and the other technologies that are up there. For monitoring at the company, the developers liked to push metrics to Librato using Drop Wizard. Um, because it was much simpler for them through the development process. And we'd made a decision, um, particularly being as we're in public cloud environments, to not open up our metric interfaces externally. So to get the metrics into our event management system, which was Zabbix, um, we used a combination of agents which ran on the virtual machines and using bash scripts to uh, query locally and get the metrics into the monitoring system. Now that was fine on large physical machines in the data center, but when we moved to a service-oriented architecture where the machines were much smaller and we got a lot more metrics, we started to suffer some CPU utilization issues. Uh, on top of that, because we were collecting all the metrics individually and we would um, we had a windowing issue whenever we wanted to compare the metrics. There was a slight delay between one and the other. So we looked at pushing the metrics into, um, into Zabbix using uh, Drop Wizard in the same sort of way. And there were some libraries available for Zabbix, but they didn't use, they didn't, none of them incorporated the discovery function, which for us was an important part of the design principle because just to reduce all the management overhead, uh, we eventually developed one, but it was, it was extra effort that we just didn't want to have. Um, and also, in the meantime, we still had to process those metrics. We really didn't like the options that we had for tiny containers. Now, <clears throat> luck would have it, while I was doing some other general container research, I came across the autopilot pattern that would later give birth to the concierge paradigm. <clears throat> Developed by a company called Joyent, some people might know from Node. Um, it's now part, uh, now part of Samsung, uh, and they've been running on the metal container native infrastructure for over 10 years now. Um, the autopilot pattern's fundamental to the whole paradigm. <clears throat> it's primarily a deployment pattern uh, that decouples your containers from the complex frameworks that everyone tells you you have to use, and leaves only two fundamental components service discovery, and application orchestration, both of which are automated by a small piece of code which runs inside the, inside the container. And this is the life cycle of an application container on the autopilot pattern. Uh, the bottom here, we've got console. Um, there's been a talk on console earlier, uh, which is our service discovery system. And then we have container pilot, which is our uh, small piece of code automating operations. Now, in this, um, in this example, we've got some, uh, some jobs and handlers that are defined. We've got pre-start and post-stop, and we've got health check, and they do what you expect 
uh, things before the application starts and after the application starts and just make sure the application's up. Now, we've also got an on-change handler. Now, throughout the lifecycle of this container, Container Pilot is querying console to find out information about its environment, upstream services that this application might be dependent upon. Um, when anything changes in our environment, it takes responsibility and uses our on-change handler to reconfigure our application. It also takes responsibility during the life cycle to take information that we want to publish about this container and publish them to console so that downstream services know how to communicate with this application. <coughs> We've got some favorite features about flying on autopilot. Firstly, we're decoupling our applications and infrastructure, leaving us with far fewer restrictions on our architecture designs. We're not tied into any orchestration frameworks. We can still use Kubernetes if we really want to. Uh, there's, there's plenty of uh, benefits we can gain from using Kubernetes, but we don't have to. We can use any of them, we can use all of them, or we can use none of them. We can containerize legacy applications. Because Container Pilot is running inside the application, it can handle uh, and, ma and manage any applications that handle standard Unix signals, even databases. The orchestration code is now the responsibility of the developer, who probably knows best how the application should run, right? And they can keep that code alongside the code for the application in the same repository. So we're effectively 12 factoring our infrastructure al alongside our application. We get drastically less management overhead. There's not a lot going on here. And we get co-processes. It used to be recommended by Docker to just run a single process inside of your container. Now, thankfully, they don't tell you to do that. That's not their best practice. It's just a, an option or a suggestion. Uh, and I'm glad they did that because I'm yet to find a really compelling reason to do this. Putting agents inside, as, I, as I've been saying, allows us to manage our containers more easily. It decouples us from other systems and we gain features of that agent out of the box. We gain things like automatic registration, container resource discovery, and discovery of upstream services. Allows us to look after legacy systems. And um, we can, if we have any um, specific compliance checks that we have to do, we could put a compliance agent in there as well and meet those requirements. Usually, these agents are off the shelf, ready to go, and somebody else is maintaining them for you. With Container Pilot, this is how simple it is to run a monitoring agent. Uh, this is our Zabbix agent. We just define a job to run the agent. We've also got a heartbeat, which we send to our monitoring system, our event manager, and a termination message, but a bit more on those later. <coughs> I don't know whether any of you will recognize this guy. He's one of the politicians in the UK that was uh, influential in the, the Brexit campaign. Um, and when I first wrote this presentation, there was a lot of pushing and pulling going on in the UK. Uh, and I thought it appropriate, um, being as I wanted to cover some of the nuances between pushing versus pulling metrics. When we started to look into the approach, we used both approaches independently. Our push model was a single snapshot um, object of all metrics sent to Librato by DropWizard third-party application which was built into the application. Our pull model was the Zabbix agent installed on the virtual machine, uh, which was querying DropWizard locally, um, post-processing that object for the single metric that it, that it wanted, um, and then getting that into the monitoring system. Now, the push model was very lightweight, but it's opinionated, um, and it's hard-coded, and we never have any confidence in the state of the application. We would just stop receiving metrics. Uh, Librato also for us was, was never going to be a thing that would solve uh, all of our event management requirements either. Our pull model uh, wasn't opinionated and could be configured dynamically and we readily knew the state of the application. Problem was all the processing that we were doing on the small VMs we had high CPU utilization issues. <clears throat> and then when we were doing things like comparing request rates, rates to error rates, we were getting some spikes of unusual results like 300% error rates. So both have got their pros and cons, but I wondered whether there was another way. I wondered whether we would uh, be able to combine the approaches and get more of the benefits of both. And this is where the concierge came in. 
We started with the courier, which isn't a small man with a large delivery, but it is a small script with a large delivery. Executed by the monitoring agent, which runs inside the virtual machine, First, it collects and delivers a manifest of what needs to be monitored from our application and sends that back to our event management system. Uh, then it takes a single request from the event manager to, um, to, to go and collect all of those metrics and deliver them back to the monitoring system all in one go. Then it records how long that process took and records that back to the monitoring system as well. So with a single request delivering all metrics in one go, our windowing issue had immediately gone away. But we are still doing the processing inside the container, so performance was still a concern. So we tested it. So this is our container metrics whilst discovering and delivering 17 metrics every 30 seconds. Uh, we have some CPU stats. Uh, we have the network load, memory, and this is the time it was taking for us to process the metrics and deliver them to the monitoring system. <clears throat> and we deliberately kept the resources tight. We wanted to give it a good test. So we only gave the container 20% um, of an i3 processor and 128 meg of RAM. And because it was a proof of concept, uh, the script was actually just reading the metrics from a file on disk. So we were doing IO as well. So this was our benchmark, and then we wanted to increase it uh, up and up and up and see where our breaking point was. And actually, we got bored because we got to 34,000 metrics, and our CPU utilization had only gone up 4%. Uh, load had only gone up 1%. Even collecting metrics from a disk, for every 10,000 metrics that we collected, we only added an extra second to the processing time. And this was the full dashboard where we can see uh, a few bytes out of memory. Um, and we can see the increase in network load. So we generally don't advise people to, 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 to collect 34,000 metrics from, from pretty much any application, let alone one that's going to be running in a container that small. Um, but, and we also knew there was a whole load of optimizations that we can make, generally not reading or doing I.O. Um, so we began to wonder what, what sort of things is actually meant to, uh, to, our, to monitoring. If you think about it for a moment, apart from all of the benefits that we get from running an agent, we also um, are do using pushing and pull um, methods. And by doing that, it's really easy for us to simulate a production-like environment on a developer's laptop. And with a couple of really simple additions to our scripts, we can do things like um, send those metrics to multiple endpoints so we're no longer opinionated about what monitoring system we use. Um, somebody wants to use Librato, somebody wants to use Zabbix, somebody wants to use Nagios. Um, or we could set it up so that we've got a specific monitoring, uh, troubleshooting location so that we can, our running instances, we can query from a specific location and get more debug information from that, um, from that application. All of this making it a very versatile approach. And this was how simple our courier's job description was for manifest uh, management. It's just eight lines of code. This is, this is the proof of concept, so it's changed a lot since then. Uh, and this was the, dis uh, the job description for delivering metrics. Uh, again, it's only a few more lines of code. I like keeping the originals up here because they show the simplicity, um, but also they fit on the presentation screen. <coughs> So, we all like to name things, and um, personally, I didn't like the push and pull method. Um, so, because of some of the thought processes I'd had around single accurate shots with immediate feedback, I, I felt like I was using a sniper rifle, um, oppo opposed to the original way we were doing things, lots of pulling, felt like, like a bit like a machine gun, we were never really hitting anything accurately. Um, push method, I don't know, you can think of it like a shotgun, maybe. Anyway. Um, because being British, uh, it felt appropriate to me to name this after a very a famous British sniper rifle, which some people might know from uh, some computer games. The Enfield method uh, gives us a number of benefits from both traditional approaches. Because we're pulling the metrics, we can easily detect things like network-wide issues and potentially back off our checks if we need to and reduce network load. Um, pulling also gives us a central place where we can uh, control of our, all of our metric timing and what metrics we actually want to look at without having to reconfigure and redeploy the application. Uh, push and pull 
working together mean that we get a, a, a really good, um, good confidence in the running state of everything in our environment. Uh, and having the performance of pushing all of our metrics in one go means that we can reduce our uh, collection intervals, meaning that we get more data points, we get more accurate graphs, and we can, act, uh, we can react to events much more quickly. Uh, I think I've just lost connectivity. I think we're good. All right. <clears throat> uh, one of the main drivers for using containers is running microservices. And many microservice applications are designed to be stateless. What is often forgotten in the architecture, though, is that we don't suddenly become stateless. Just because one application has no state, the system as a whole probably still has quite a lot of state. Uh, how many instances of something are running, how many request rates we're seeing for any uh, particular service. And really, these are some of the most fundamentally important pieces of state information we have about the whole system. How it looks now, how it looked before the last event, how it looked this time last week, and how we believe that it should look right now. Under the concierge paradigm, we've got all this information together, so we've now got a really accurate live and historic view of the system as a whole. Keeping this information together gives Dev and Ops the ability to collaborate on um, all the same data, um, similar systems, and making this information easily accessible, it's now much easier for us to be able to manipulate the state. <coughs> With all this information in one place, it's quick and easy to find out what assets we've got running, what assets have recently terminated, and a ton of information about all of them. Um, so it soon became apparent that we've actually got now everything that we need to know um, to solve the last of the problems that we originally had, scaling. And we did it with another very simple script, which acted as a personal assistant to our event manager. Let's just quickly remind ourselves what's going on. We've got all these containers that are registering to notify their existence to our event management system and other containers. Um, we've got all the, in the monitoring system, every, all, everybody probably does the same thing. We're grouping like um, services together into a host group, so we have a service definition there already. We know all the instances that are running in a particular service. And we have this, now have this big ACID database with all this information in it. So all the script had to do was just query this database and run Docker Compose Scale. Because the paradigm is extending uh, an already very mature monitoring and event management system, when we want to scale, the events that we're scaling on can have highly detailed profiles. We have so many metrics which we can apply to our scaling profiles. We have so many different functions that we can apply to those metrics. We can even have um, things like predictive functions. So we can predict what our scale is likely to be based on the historic information we have in our event management system and pre-scale our services uh, ready for load, which is likely to happen. And then we can scale across multiple services. So if we give you an example of a, an, app, an example application that we want to scale on queue depth, but that application is talking to an upstream database. If that upstream database has performance issues, it's going to increase the queue depth on our application. The last thing that we want to do is start adding more applications because we're going to turn a poorly performing database into a very dead database. So we could put a trigger on that says only scale up our application if we've got a happy database and we have high queue depth. Because we're running containers, we're not limited to just horizontally scaling. We can give them more memory. We can give them more CPU utilization if that's going to be more appropriate to the application. Um, <clears throat> and if your event manager has a trigger escalation feature, which you get in Zabbix, you can keep repeating actions until we get back to the desired state that we're looking for. All of this gives us considerable control over our environment. The script was so simple. This literally was the whole uh, proof of concept script that we had. Uh, I know it's a Python conference, but it was written in Bash when we first did it. It's not anymore. Um, so yeah, it just, just shows how simple that was. And here's the timeline of the containers under the concierge paradigm. I've left out uh, container pilot for brevity. And what's going on here is we have our container up the top with our monitoring uh, agent, uh, basic OS, and the application. When it first spins up, 
the agent takes responsibility for registering it with our event manager. Um, then it goes about monitoring all the things from the, the, the basic container metrics which need to be monitored and publish them back to the monitoring system. It also does our discovery bit, sends the manifest back to our monitoring server, and then we take requests to deliver those metrics. Now let's say our application wants to scale on request rates. And we put a threshold on there, says if it breached this request rate, then what we want to do um, is tell our scheduler to give us more containers. So we get a breach here of request rates, uh, and our monitoring system says, sees a trigger, tells the scheduling script to start up a new container. So let's hope the demo gods are looking favorably on me. <clears throat> I'll show you quickly what we're, what we're doing. Okay, so what we've got, there's my mouse. What I've done, uh, because of being limited on time, I have pre scaled an environment. Uh, we have a, uh, some compose files for a basic network and our event management system and then I've added in some example applications and we can see them all running. And I'll just quickly show you these. Um, uh, I can't see very well from here. So uh, we have some basic compose files. This is our squid proxy. And in our basic network environment, all we do is uh, allow a network to be predefined. This is just a demo. Um, and we have a minimum requirement of console. And here I've actually, because I'm running it on my laptop, I need a Docker API for the event management to, to talk to. Um, on the Mac, it's all a library rather than an actual full-blown engine. So I have to hook back into it. Um, and then our event management system uh, is... Uh, MySQL, Zabbix, um, and a web interface. So the way we actually generate these is we use uh, Ansible playbooks to effectively as co-generation tool. So we use them so that uh, any of our engineers, whenever they want to create containers, it's going to be part of the concierge paradigm. They can run the playbooks, which I will show you, with some very basic requirements that, are, uh, that they have to input into those playbooks. And we always get a standardized uh, image and configuration at the end. So uh, it starts with, uh, I think this is what I'm looking for, uh, our main top level playbook, which uh, pulls down our sub modules, which are our upstream roles. We have one for configuring our application and uh, creating all of our compose files and our container pilot files. Uh, we build an image and we have uh, the tests. Can everybody see at the back? All right, very good. Um, and we, what, we, what we've done with this is made it so that the uh, developers or engineers can simply just drop in some templates for things that they um, want to add to the configuration of their application. Um, and automatically at the other end, oh, and, a, and an install script. So in the files, we have uh, an install.sh. So there's very few, along with the variables that go with those, there's, there's a very low level uh, entry to getting out the other end what we feel is a high standard of um, things like labels, everything that's included into our container pilot uh, configuration. So we have a uh, container pilot.json template here, which is what everybody will pick up and they will automatically get a uh, container pilot configuration that we know will include our console agent, uh, will force our console agent to leave um, happily. Um, our heartbeat, which I showed you earlier, our monitoring system, and then our definition of our job for all our application. So we then we now know it's a very low entry to, uh, to, to basically creating high quality containers. Um, <clears throat> so when we actually uh, are running that environment, we now have um, Apache running and we have some console templates. 
Now, this is going to be querying console and configuring an upstream remote proxy for our Apache server. And if we look at 19.083128, uh, we will see that as our squid GCP proxy 0 0.8 automatically created for us. Um, <coughs> So, as part of all the monitoring side of things, we're automatically registering our applications with our monitoring system. We automatically discover our Docker volumes by the features of the agent that we're using. Um, <clears throat> we can also look and see some example uh, API metrics. So, we've still got the demo metrics file which we used before uh, and we can look at the timers and we can see that we've discovered and started collecting all of our API metrics from our dummy drop wizard interface. I'm getting quite a sore neck from this. Um, so so this is handled by our courier script, um, which I, I want to go into too much detail about it. Um, I think this is our courier. Our entry point into the application wants to first check whether we're reading from a file on disk. If not, we will call get HTTP metrics instead of file metrics. Um, we define these functions here. We hard code local host because we don't want anybody reaching out from the application to pull things down into the application for security reasons uh, and we get a, a json object that we can then pass into um, our functions so we try to write the code so it's always reusable um, and self-documenting um, so by doing uh, in that way we've created a consume metric records function which uses um, dependency injection, where we actually pass in the name of the functions that this function is then going to call out to. So, for example, uh, we have different formats of that we're going to use depending on whether we're sending metrics or whether we're discovering metrics. So, one passes in the sender format function and consume metrics recalls that and one calls um, sender format. <coughs> okay. So uh, let's show uh, a quick scaling of our containers. Um, so if I reset this again and I say squid, we can see that for our squid service, we have one container running. So all of our containers are sending our heartbeat message to our container. We just count those so that we know how many containers we're running for our squid service. Um, so now we can change the scaling value. So we would normally do this through an API, but I'm just going to show you what's going on um, inside of our squid service defined. We have uh, a macro and currently our minimum scale is zero. Now that's not a very good number to have. So what we're going to say is that we always want to have uh, at least two of those containers running. And what this is going to do is we have a trigger defined on our monitoring system which says if our minimum requirement is less than our minimum requirement, which over here is container state minimum scaling number, then we'll get an alert. When that alert happens, we will fire off an action to scale up due to too few instances running. And this is going to run our scheduling script, which the details are here where we pass in some values from our service. Our scheduling scripts. Um, I'm going to quickly run over it. Um, entry point is to uh, we use ArcPass. We like ArcPass. Um, 
We take container, we take the uh, URL, which in our case is the uh, Docker API instance that I created for the demo. Um, we take the project for the service, um, and then we scale the particular service name. We know the current scale because we've got the event management system, which is keeping track of our state. Um, and the, the current scale and what we actually want to scale to. Now, we then pass that on to our concierge Docker module, which is fundamentally the same thing as the uh, bash script we saw before, but just making it a bit better by putting it in Python. Now, we should have seen a scaling event happen. No? Um, we should have some triggers. I don't know what I've done with that page. Let's just go to it anyway. And there we go. So we had an alert which said less than our minimum requirement. Um, and we've also got some other things going on. Uh, and I would have expected that I would have seen a scale up event, but the demo gods are not playing nice, maybe. So, oh no, there we go. We have a scaling event. So our script kicked off, and this is all the uh, <coughs> uh, interpolation of the variables that we passed into it. Our Docker API, squid GCP proxy, current scale one, scale up by one, and now we have this here. And if we go into back to our monitoring, we should now see two containers. There we go. Oh. Okay, uh, oh, and lastly, we can actually see that what happens uh, in console as well. We can see, if I refresh that page, we can see that we've now got two squid instances here. We've now got a uh, .9, and inside of our configuration for Apache, now we've automatically configured there as well. So, let's see if I can get back to the presentation. <clears throat> so what we're doing here is integrating a number of active systems and processes like discovery, scaling, um, failover, monitoring, passive patterns like using a proxy in between these services, um, separate the application from important decisions like what backends to connect to uh, or how to handle failures of those backends. Active patterns give that control back to the application. And by doing so, we eliminate more complexity, uh, we eliminate misdirection, and we reduce latency because we've not got another system that we're, we're going through, making us faster, more reliable, and more resilient. So in conclusion, once we'd considered the autopilot pattern and the Enfield method, the whole concierge paradigm just fell into place, almost accidentally. And all aspects of running containers um, it just just seemed to happen for us. Uh, probably because we were pretty much doing all of these things already, and you may be too. And because this is very few new things to learn, getting something set up is much quicker than some of the orchestration frameworks. So where do we go from here? Well, we're seeking just other people to try and get involved, perhaps tidy up our Python code. We're not Python developers. Um, and uh, and our code's online, so you can quite easily just uh, get something running as quickly as possible, have a look at the Ansible playbooks. I don't recommend you use those. Those are our uh, things that we see as things that we want to um, put out in our containers, but they're perhaps a good, useful starting point. Feedback uh, and improve in the true tradition of open source. So I realize I've kind of rushed through everything pretty quickly. Um, so if, if there are any questions, then... Uh, uh, please ask them, and these are other ways in which you can find us. Thank you. <laughs>